So as we've just heard from uh, Keeman and Brian, um, gestures and uh, physics simulating interactions uh, that, that POP enables uh, really fit hand in hand together. Uh, and it's very important to make sure that those things are uh, performant and smooth. Um, it, in fact, if they aren't realistic, um, it's really not worth doing them at all. And the, the reason is that uh, the delight they're intended to create just instantly turns into an annoyance. Uh, it becomes an imposition to using the app uh, and a frustration rather than uh, helping a user understand the information flow uh, in your application. Uh, and honestly, uh, it really is uh, worse than, than not having them at all. Um, so in looking at how to do this, um, you need to remember that both touches and animations are equally important. Brian described this, but uh, we, we think of uh, animations as simply continuation of gestures. Uh, and both of them uh, actually require processing every single frame. Um, so if we look at, uh, uh, if we look at how this is done in paper, um, it's, it's really uh, pervasive and uh, we think it's just really fun to use uh, interfaces like this that are smooth and easy to navigate, uh, yet are also playful and uh, very clear in explaining where, uh, where content moves in reaction to your touch. Um, now, if we think about uh, before iOS 7, um, it was actually very uncommon to see uh, dynamic animations or, or continuous gestures. Uh, by default, uh, really static single taps, discrete gestures, and, and static animations were uh, the standard. Um, really, animations were fire and, uh, fire and forget. Uh, the APIs even encoded this and made it very easy to run a completion block after the animation is completely done. Um, UI Navigation Controller is a great example of this. You typically tap a row or a button and it pushes something on screen and during that interval, uh, the user really can't do anything else and uh, that sort of uh, informed a lot of the other interactions that were built into the system. Um, now, if we think about iOS 7 and apps like Paper and of course new apps that are uh, coming out today, um, this has really uh, started to change. Um, and what makes these interactions different is that they're very sensitive to stalls on the main thread. Um, Brian alluded to this as well, but the, uh, the render server that Core Animation provides uh, is an out of process construct that uh, makes static animations extremely smooth and is highly optimized for that use case. But because these animations are interactive and react to gestures that are being delivered as touch streams to the main thread of your application, uh, it's simply not performant to interact with another process by mock interprocess communication uh, as the user uh, performs their, their gestures. Um, what this means is that uh, it, previously the operating system scheduler could take a slow single core iPhone and time slice any, anything you're doing on the main thread, even if it spans multiple frames. Uh, and keep animations fluid by ensuring that the animation thread has the highest priority of anything on the system. Uh, that actually can't happen in this world because the OS scheduler has no purview over your main thread aside from giving it runtime. So if, if you block that, that is uh, up to you to, uh, to resolve. Um, so where else have we seen this? It, it turns out that UI scroll view has demonstrated this problem forever, but it's not necessarily obvious that it's related to uh, these other types of interactions. Inertial scrolling and the deceleration effect of scroll views is a physics simulating interaction. And in fact, it's a decay uh, animation that POP makes very easy to implement uh, directly as well. Um, there just hasn't been an API that exposes doing this, and it's actually internal to the implementation of uh, scroll view that sort of implements that uh, progressive per frame deceleration of the view. Uh, what, it, what this amounts to is that blocking the main frame, uh, the main thread inevitably results in delayed gesture processing and, and also jumpy physics. So what actually causes most of these frame drops? Just as a, a general guideline, you're looking at about five milliseconds uh, in, in terms of how much time you have before it's likely that uh, you will cause the device to drop a frame. Um, 
that, you know, that value varies uh, a little bit depending on the complexity of your view hierarchy. Uh, basically, there's a bunch of other stuff the system has to accomplish in a 16 millisecond frame, and depending on how material that work is, that will change the amount of time you have. It's best to benchmark this based on the slowest device that you intend to support, which for most people is the iPhone 4 right now. Um, things that commonly take more than five milliseconds on the main thread are uh, layout subviews, primarily sizing text, uh, rendering just about anything, including drawing glyphs uh, of text, decoding images, whether they be PNG assets or downloaded JPEGs, or rendering arbitrary graphics, core graphics, uh, creating, say, a gradient instead of loading a, an image asset. But also UI view, uh, simply initializing them is relatively expensive. You're often creating whole trees of them. Um, adding subviews, removing from super view, these things actually send notifications to other views that the, the changes have occurred. They uh, walk the, the hierarchy to check if there should be a new first responder. Um, and again, even deallocating views uh, is expensive. Um, so why can't we actually just optimize all of these things? Uh, that's what has been common for uh, optimizing scroll views. Um, that actually is, uh, a, a good idea certainly isn't something you should avoid, but you always get to this point where there are no reasonable or easy optimizations left. And at that stage, you're left with basically compromising the design or uh, shipping something as slow for uh, users on, on the oldest phones that you want to support or waiting for new hardware. Um, and none of those are really good options. Um, so if especially if it's not just a scroll view that stutters, but your whole interface is sensitive to main thread stalls, you need a, a much more structural solution to this. Um, so can we actually just solve each of these things separately uh, in, in a new way? Um, that, that's definitely a great place to start. Divide and conquer, we're all extremely familiar with. Um, image decoding is, is done this way by most applications that do any amount of image decoding because if you were to use UI image view, you'd get 500 millisecond stalls on the main thread instead of five millisecond stalls. So it's pretty much not an option to ship most apps without that. Um, but again, if you have this sensitivity everywhere in the app, uh, this is actually a challenging thing to do in, in all contexts. And it turns out that a comprehensive solution is actually easier from a development perspective and results in uh, better performance as well. Um, so if we look at what we're working with here, uh, UIKit and, and Core Animation are incredible frameworks, but they were designed for this, this render server architecture. Again, highly optimized for the use case they were built for, but they are designed specifically for use on the main thread. Uh, merely allocating one of these classes off the main thread can crash, even if you don't do anything else besides allocate it. Um, yet these frameworks provide such critical functionality that uh, no develop developer could reasonably hope to uh, uh, re-implement that any solution really does need to integrate with uh, these frameworks and, and not try to recreate them. Um, so what we looked at uh, was actually just the relationship between C A layer and, um, and UI view and thought, well, UI view adds a bunch of uh, features to C A layer um, that, that core animation didn't think to implement. So we can actually do the same to, to UI kit. And so we added a third type of object uh, that we call a node uh, and we made it thread safe. Uh, and so we programmed to this thing instead of views. Uh, and we can allocate them uh, on background threads and manipulate them in, in any way we like. And it marshals interaction to the, uh, the core system frameworks in a way that is uh, performant and also safe for their constraints. Uh, the relationships here are strong reference on the top and weak reference on the bottom. So what does this actually enable? Um, one is asynchronous layout. Uh, so before ever creating any of the, the system backing objects, we can create a, a whole tree of these things uh, and trivially call a layout method uh, on them, and that will traverse through the, the hierarchy and perform text sizing calculations. Uh, fortunately, core text is uh, thread safe, which is tremendously useful. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, we would have trouble with that. Um, so asynchronous rendering is kind of the, the next part of, of this. And, um, 
display uh, is called directly by core animation, but we just take this as a hint that something needs to be displayed, not that it has to be done now and block the main thread doing so. Uh, so as you can see here, this is very nearly the actual code we've written. It, it really is that simple. Uh, and we basically just schedule a uh, display to happen soon uh, on a, a background queue. And then when it's done, we bounce back to the main thread because uh, layers cannot be interacted with off the main thread and set uh, the buffer that we allocated to be the contents of the layer. Now, this is uh, interesting and very useful for us, but we quickly discovered that by doing an abstraction like this, as opposed to targeting each of those problems directly, we get a bunch of other really interesting optimizations that uh, can only be enabled by something like this. One is, is layer backing. It turns out that um, a lot of places in your application's view hierarchy don't need the features that are present in uh, UI view. It primarily adds event handling and some other things like accessibility, uh, which is extremely important, yet there are portions of the view hierarchy that are uh, sort of at a very low level that don't need the distinguishing power that you, you get with views. And because views are much more costly to create than layers, uh, of course, they create layers every, every view you create, but they add a lot on top of that. Um, if you have something like a text label inside of a button that never needs event handling because the button does the event handling, it would be great to just avoid creating the views. Unfortunately, uh, if you're coding directly to views and layers, this is really messy because the APIs don't match very well and you have to change the superclass. Um, but since we're programming to uh, this node concept, we can simply enable um, a Boolean property that uh, avoids creating the view. Uh, we don't get event handling callbacks and a few other features of, of UI view, uh, but it's very trivial to do this. Uh, and so paper ships with about 50% fewer views than it would otherwise need. So what is subtree precompositing? Um, as, as you can see with the transition a bit, uh, it's uh, the concept of taking uh, a bunch of objects that are um, authored as independent constructs, but then uh, compressing them down into a single texture that can be provided to the GPU. Um, as we saw with Jason's talk, um, link booklets, for example, that, that we've designed are really convenient to uh, build in a, a way that uh, you can change the layout of, say, the author byline uh, that can appear in many different locations. Um, but it really would be more efficient to write a huge draw rect method that just uh, sort of applied all of these uh, graphical transformations to a single uh, buffer. Um, CA layer provides something sort of like this, but it's uh, completely opaque. So if you change certain uh, layer properties, they can easily trigger a re-rasterization, which is incredibly expensive. Uh, and there are no good tools for you to actually figure out that that's happening. Uh, and it's extremely easy for that to be done accidentally. Um, so one example of this, again, these link booklets, uh, you can see there's almost a dozen different sorts of uh, subviews that you would naturally want to put in here and, and lay them out. Uh, and we simply enable this property for the, the attachment itself and uh, we perform software compositing to compress them down into a single texture. Uh, this actually allows us to take layer backing to another extreme, and instead of just not creating the views, we can avoid creating the layers too. And so we actually don't have any views or layers beneath these, uh, these attachments uh, and just have a, a single buffer. Um, so concurrency. All recent uh, system on chip uh, designs that Apple ha has produced uh, are at dual core currently, and the trend is, is only going up. Uh, and as of the A7, these are incredibly powerful cores, uh, and it really would be a shame to waste uh, even a percentage of, of a single core. Uh, and while asynchronous operation is really what's necessary for smoothness, if you take advantage of both cores, you can minimize wait times and actually make your app load faster as well. Um, about 80% of iOS devices in active use today are dual core. Uh, it's pretty much just the iPhone 4 that's commonly used that's single core. Uh, so we can take the uh, layout operations I described and make those concurrent. So for example, if you load 10 new stories in paper, uh, we actually take uh, each of those stories and put them on a concurrent queue for sizing. So we're performing text sizing on uh, multiple stories at once. Uh, and also we can take uh, text and images and graphics 
put those on a concurrent queue as well, and uh, they will be processed as, as quickly as possible, even though they're uh, very different amounts of time required to render a small text string or decode a huge image. Um, interestingly, this also improves performance per watt out of these uh, CPUs. Um, there's a concept known as race to sleep, where the, the quicker you can accomplish your work, the more quickly the CPU will be able to enter a low power state, uh, and, and this actually really makes a material difference. Um, so that's uh, something that I think w uh, we'd love to hear your ideas on and um, are happy to answer questions on. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes now for all of our presenters to come up uh, to answer uh, uh, questions. We'll be around after that as well to talk to you directly. Um, and indeed, the rest of our team is here as well. So if you have a question that's best for one of them, we'll, we'll bring them up.